Durch Deutschland geht ein tiefer Riss, der spaltet die Nation. Ne Neuheit ist das nicht gewiss, doch von Interesse schon. Das Beispiel Krupp und Krause klärt den wirklichen Verlauf. Der deutschen Spaltung zugehört als Klassenfrage auf. Denn Krupp ist Monopolherr und Krause ist Polit. Das ist der Klassengegensatz, den jedermann versteht. Hello and welcome to episode two of the Young Hegelians podcast. With us today, we've got Allison. Hello. We've got Young. What's up? And myself, Zia. And we're going to be going over the book Capitalist Realism by Mark Fisher. So the, the central thesis of capitalist uh, realism or capitalist realism in a nutshell is that it's the idea that uh, capitalism and elements of capitalism are so ingrained in us that it's easier to imagine just like the extinction of humanity than that system actually ending or being superseded in any way. It's either, I, 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 I'm, I think it was Frederick Jameson who said it first, or he, I can't, I don't really know, but it was Frederick Jameson and Jesus said it around the same time. One of them said it first, obviously. Uh, and it was in reference to this cultural outpouring of these movies, like disaster movies, end of the world movies, like 2012 movies, like, Michael Bay's entire oeuvre, zombie movies, up the wazoo. And this was all coming around at the time of the financial crisis, 2007. And from 2007 to 2011, there was quite a bit of civil and social unrest and whatever. But at the same time, there was this sort of long overhang of despair. So the thesis was just that, yeah, like, uh, it's almost comforting for us to imagine the end of the world, especially in light of climate change and so on. And then it is because it's just capitalism has become hegemonic and it's naturalized itself so effectively that there's no horizon beyond it so and since capitalism is inconsistent with the continuation of the human species as with climate change therefore it is a logical deduction for that would be that it actually is easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism it's that tendency just you know like actualized right it's funny it's like a lot of people have now made this point just as a tangent, like Latour says, you know, it used to be that nature was fixed and culture was malleable. But now we have geoengineering and genetic engineering and climate change, but we have hegemony of neoliberalism. So now culture and society seems fixed, but nature is malleable. That's like the same idea. As I was saying before, I actually don't like this because I just don't like slogans in general. But first, mostly it's because it is accurate, I think, with regard to this generalized malaise and uh, phenomenon of disaster and zombie movies. And I think as a general description of people, of most people, and of, I don't know, for lack of a better word, because I don't actually believe this exists, our cultural unconscious, I think it's probably valid. It's like, you know, an impressionist painting, the more closer you look at it, it becomes a bunch of squiggly lines. And, and my central problem with it is that, first of all, it's, you know, what is it, like 30 to 40% of millennials say they prefer socialism to capitalism. And I, and I know we all know that that's like a whatever statistic but well, especially seen... because they this... bernie is socialist right yeah. right but it goes back to the point that i made in the pre-pod discussion which was just that people can imagine the end of capitalism when they're not really doing it right i don't know i mean we saw lots of outpourings of things you know occupy or whatever i mean that's a while ago now but for a while what is it Das Kapital, and then later <laughs> Piketty's Capital is so funny. Or like the bestsellers on Amazon's economics. I mean, the soothsayers like to read evidence from these, even though there's they're stupid statistics. Anyway, my it's just in my experience is that it is actually very easy for people to imagine the end of capitalism. But most of the time when I hear people imagine the end of capitalism, what they describe is just like capitalism. I don't know. It's like this weird petty bouge fantasy. Yeah. Everybody has a house and a car and a dog and a job and a wife or whatever. Everybody has a wife. Stay the same. Stay the same. Day wise. And then, uh, and, but uh, it works nine to five. And, Even the wives have wives. Yeah, well, oh of course. <laughs> There's one long chain of uh, that's way, that way no one has exclusive my wife privilege to say, you know, my wife. Anyway, please edit this part out. Uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs>
you know, a sticky point, I have a little other such list. I don't want to really get this entire debate. We'll have a whole episode on it. It's like, you know, focusing on the state and right. prisons and work and extractivism and enclosure. Those are other institutions that people naturalize to a degree where it's like, we're these radical uh, leftists, we're the communists, but in the name of you know, rejecting idealism in favor of something more realistic. You'll often see Marxists that are like, getting rid of the family? Hmm, sounds like idealism, even though it's yeah. like in the communist manifesto. <laughs> it, it's also like, it doesn't even, like, getting rid of the, abolishing the family in, in the in the sense that leftists use it doesn't mean we're going to go like with the fucking police, force couples to divorce or whatever. It's, 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 oh. it's like, no, that's what it's, I mean. Oh, okay. Well, I guess we could do it, but, uh, and then we have to make gay marriage mandatory. But that goes without saying. That's of course. Of course. Of course. Uh, I mean, I it, did it, my part already. Like, right. With that whole yes. thing. Yeah. So, the, these, the, those things are, like, naturalized, in my experience, even more intensely, because even leftists who clearly critique capitalism, as you say, also will naturalize those things. And they share that naturalization with liberals and so yeah. on. But the problem with that perspective, I find, is that in every case, you're talking about leftists who, quote unquote, have a critique of capitalism, but accept institutions like the police force. Except when some when you look at these communists that uh, believe in the eternal police force, they don't really have very good critiques of capitalism at all. I mean, that's probably true. As a general rule, like this phenomenon is going to be found more among social democrats and, and MLs, you know, without starting any left wing fighting here. Uh, why why their, did you their, repeat yourself? Their, 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 their relationship to leftism as such, or, market, or communism as such, is, like, you know, uh, tendentious at times. But, you know, don't worry, I love all my uh, social democratic and Marxist Leninist MUFOs uh, and IRL friends. Don't worry. I think we but, did the uh, song and dance last episode. No, the yes. difference is I don't anymore. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. And the pushback, you know, on some of these things like prison, work, and extractivism, like the pushback people and state that people give when you say, well, why not critique these two? I mean, it's always very intense and very emotional, right? Here kind of weird there's another thing too which is that um if we're gonna be like gramscians or althusserians or whatever ians or leptcons you know we have to we have this idea that like you know the horizon of our imagination is almost certainly constrained by the current system of capitalist relations and in that sense it's true that it might be easier to imagine the end of capitalism the end of the world that's in some sense a feature not a bug and the yeah. whole and the whole point is, in the insurrectionary literature, the IT always goes, that the whole point of this rupture is that it creates this new space for relating and imagining in ways yeah. that were totally non in, unconceived of before. But you don't have to be an insurrectionary to think that that's like a cool idea. Yeah, one of the many things that draws me towards like organizing with anarchists to begin with. I remember reading an article on Commune Magazine about that Ursula Le Guin novel that people always recommend. The Dispossessed? Uh, yeah, Dispossessed. And one of the points that they brought up about it that was very, very interesting to me was the idea that it's fictional, but it makes communism seem like a very real, possible society. And it does this by not presenting it as the end of problems for people to deal with. It's right. not that we've, that we've, that there's a, oh no, a final solution. That's not There's, a... <laughs> there's no utopia. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Yes, all things. It's it's like human struggles can it, the, the form changes after the abolition of class society, but it, you know, there there's still things to there's there's still stuff to be done, right? Yeah, there's still gonna be heartbreak and 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 conflict and uh inst and logistical issues and society. Even a utopia can ossify, so they're a stateless egalitarian society. But at the beginning of the book, like um. Yeah, it's like basically their society has become more abundant. I mean, it's equal and, and it's all this stuff in name only, but it's like not so great to live in. It's all wrote and ritualized and it has none of this like whatever. And then the main character is like a physics genius and he gets thrown into the politics of the this other planet, which has like this global north, global south and and second world dynamic. Uh, and 
you know, revolutions in their society because he creates this thing called the Ansible, which allows crusts, whatever. And then, and then that also reciprocally alters his society that he's from as well and sort of restarts, reignites the juices of whatever, of, of revolution or revolutionary right, right. dreaming at least. And uh, yeah, anyway, I like that idea a lot, actually. One of the interesting things that, that, that this book does is I think it starts pretty much every chapter with a with a reference to to media, usually something well known, which and is it, one way to explain to lose or whatever, right? <laughs> just like talk about movies instead. Or also, you look at something like that book and, and compare it to something like V for Vendetta. They're just miles different in like so many important ways. The obvious one is how it seems like that society conceives of revolution as a spirit bomb. Um, <laughs> It would really come it out the, on the right in day. V for Vend- yeah, which in is v the metaphor Vendetta. that we, we would always use for, like, I- idealism, you know, lend me your power, right. you know, yeah. thoughts and prayers <laughs> consolidating into, like, a ball of energy. But they do, well, like, the this pseudo-material uh, version of that, <laughs> which is, you know, everybody walks up to this, this state building at once, and then, like, the revolution is is won without a single shot fired just because you know we're so popular that you, the, the corrupt government realizes gets, gets, the error of their way he does blow up the they do blow up the uh whatever they put the but that's like a purely them. symbolic thing like well, it's not like that was like they a, also a, break a into the house they break into the the well, that was like they the, the, kill the dictator like, don't they 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 do but like that that also kind of reinforces the idea that oh you just gotta get rid of a few of bad people right I, I don't get me wrong I actually like the movie just for different reasons now it's one um, of those movies like Fight Club which can be enjoyed at a very like juvenile phase in somebody's life but I think that there's still like genuinely there's still something to like there when you grow up you you appreciate the film differently. Yeah. But, and well, I mean, it's like, okay, the the author, the guy who wrote, what's his name, Alan Moore, right? Peter Vendetta, is that? Or is he Alan? Yeah. I, always get, I always get Alan Moore, Alan Grant, and Grant Morrison confused. I've committed comic heresy. Uh, Alan Moore, yeah. You know, Alan Moore, when he said, when he said, I wrote the comic as a, about uh, anarchism versus fascism and as an allegory for thatcherism whereas the movie is about liberalism versus american neoconservatism so he's like 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 he said yeah. he actually didn't like the, the movie as a result and i think that's like a more fair thing is that it's like it's like the liberal wachowski interpretation of anarchism versus like a fascistized made fascist neoconservatism yeah yeah i mean i mean yeah, as a young neocon. Um, <laughs> oh, uh, no. uh, uh, anyway, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, Children of Men, I think, is a, you know, Zizek actually sold me on that movie because I didn't like it when I was a kid, but he, Zizek made me like it, and I like it more than uh, Beaver and Vendetta now. That one's like interesting because it's, it it's like a society with no history, right? The idea is that England is a country without. It doesn't have like a constitutional, doesn't have some like guaranteed order. It's it's guaranteed order comes from its relationship to history, like through like the common law. And so without any children in the future, there's no continuation of the species and therefore there's no sort of like tie to history. And so like but every and everything carries on rote and procedurally and whatever. And Fisher talks about this too, like the it all is just rote and procedural and everybody just does it and no one's even questioning it as the world burns and so on and it's all out of view, but everything is just mm. sullen and broken and shitty and fascistic. And everybody's hopeless. They can't even see the reason for living anymore. There's no continuation. I don't know. Anyway, mm. let me find he, the- He talks about the, the temporality of like the end of humanity in a very interesting way, too, where, where it's not that the event is behind us or in, in front of us. It's that we are- admit amidst decline and it's mm-hmm. the sort of decline that we could easily uh, imagine our own society being in at this uh moment through the the idea that nothing really changes yeah the more things change the more it's they just like pretty. yeah it's like <laughs> kind of it's kind of like intro level wrote cynicism that's just a whole way of being excuse for complacency 
complacent uh, whatever uh, I, yeah. just, I just mixed compl- uh, complacency and complicity or whatever but uh anyway the, the passage in the in, in capitalist realism he says the widespread sense that not only is capitalism the only viable and political economic system but also now that it's impossible to even imagine a coherent alternative to it once dystopian films and novels were exercised in as such acts of imagination the disasters they depicted acting as narrative pretext for the emergence of different ways of living. Not so in Children of Men. The world that it projects seems more like an extrapolation or exacerbation of ours than an alternative to it. In its world, as in ours, ultra-authoritarianism and capital are by no means incompatible. In internment camps and franchise coffee bars coexist. In Children of Men, public space is abandoned, given over to uncollected garbage and stalking animals. One especially, one especially resonant scene takes place in a derelict school through which a deer runs. Neoliberals, the capitalist realist par excellence, have celebrated the destruction of public space, but contrary to their official hopes, there is no withering away of the state and children of men, only a stripping back of its state to its core military and police functions. I say official hopes since neoliberalism surreptitiously relied on the state system, even while it has ideologically excoriated it. This was made spectacularly clear during the banking crisis of 2008. Anyway, um... The catastrophe of Children of Men is neither waiting down the road nor has it already happened. Rather, it is being lived through. There is no punctual moment of disaster. The world doesn't end with a bang. It winks out, unravels, gradually falls apart. What caused the catastrophe to occur, who knows? Its cause lies long in the past, so absolutely detached from the present as to seem like the caprice of a malign being, a negative miracle, a malediction with no penitence can, which no penitence can ameliorate. Such a blight can only be eased by an intervention that can no more be anticipated than was the onset of the curse in the first place. Action is pointless. Only senseless hope makes sense. Superstition and religion, the first resorts of the helpless proliferate, uh, da, 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 connects with the suspicion that the end has already come. Uh, but now we only have reiteration, repermutation, no breaks, no shocks of the new. There must be something, the weak messianic hope that there must be something new in the way lapses into morose conviction that nothing new can ever happen. We do not need to wait for children of events near future to arrive to see the transformation of culture into museum pieces. Power of capitalist realism derives from the way that capitalism subsumes and consumes all of previous history. One effect of its system of equivalence, can, which can assign all cultural objects, whether they are religious iconography, pornography, or das Kapital, a monetary value. But this, I mean, this is actually good because it does literally link all the main themes of the the book. (laughs) Yeah, it it doesn't really want to. I think, like, the next media reference he goes into is Wally, which I found really interesting. I I haven't actually watched the film myself. I've I've just seen, you know, scenes from it that everyone posts around. Wally is, like, an an environmentalist film. It's about how humanity has gone on a voyage in space from away from a planet that they've completely destroyed environmentally. Earth is just a garbage planet and all all like plants are are dead on it. But the, the way that people it, it humanity's almost like on a cruise. It's like a vacation. Yeah. Uh the the ship that they're on is this consumerist paradise where everyone is horribly obese. Nobody ever talks to each other except through social media. And it seems like every, nobody has a job. Like, there's no wage labor, uh, just consumption. Well, so, it's like the Matrix, right? Their wage labor is their consumption. Like, <laughs> like do you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, what yeah, yeah. would say is like, it's power, it is powered by their desires themselves. You know, it's like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's funny too, it's like, you know, uh, Robert Nozick, you know, he's a libertarian philosopher. And he has the thought experiment of the pleasure machine. And the pleasure machine would fully simulate reality and would give you all the ple- pleasure you wanted or whatever and, like, constantly. And it would have no hedonic treadmill because it would always escalate it and vary it sufficiently that you wouldn't uh, accustom to it. And it would even simulate the satisfaction of problems through the so- solution of real real challenges so you don't even get that objection to it. And he says, you know, but people still are completely averse to this idea, right? Like, it's uh, revol- revolting. But what I think is funny that Nozick doesn't, make, like, make the connect. Oh, I mean, he kind of does, but he doesn't, he's not He's not self-aware enough to realize that, like, that is, like, the sine qua non of, like, what capitalism is. I don't know. I mean, he does kind of, because the whole point is he's responding to this, like, utilitarian, uh, liberal utilitarian worldview. 
the vulgarization of it at least and uh, and it's was he way, responding to Rawls? Well, it's more about utilitarians, right? Because with um, right. Rawls, Rawls would say that he's a Kantian, not a utilitarian, despite him clearly integrating aspects of both. He says the primary thesis: if the primary thesis of hedonism is that pleasure is good, then any component of life that is not pleasurable, nothing occurs in well-being. Those and most is held by many value theorists, but most famously by classical utilitarians. He attacks the thesis by a thought experiment. Shows that if there's something other than yeah yeah his his idea is that just like we intuitively have a different idea of a value than simply pleasure. I mean it's not it's a really kind of like it's a strong thought experiment, but it's a weak inference. Anyway, all I'm saying is it's it just it's interesting because to me it's like the pleasure machine. Well, I mean actually the talk about in the Matrix, the first iteration of it was a pleasure machine, and people rejected it. So there, that's actually very interesting. Right, and that's like very similar to Wally. I mean it's like. Somewhere, somewhere between uh, Black Mirror and Robert Nozick's Furious Machine. And, <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah, yeah, anyway. Yeah. One interesting thing about the setting of Wally, though, it sort of reveals a lot of liberals' belief that, oh, we can just get to full automation with capitalism. Right. Just, it seems to imagine that outcome where there's no longer a wage labor mechanism, but people are still in a consumer society which makes it seem like they're buying products, right? They're constantly watching advertisements, but it's unclear whether there is, from what I recall, whether there's any actual sales. So it's like, is this a monetary society? Like, it, as a Marxist, I just have all these questions about what the fuck is going on in Wally. Oh, it's social credit, comrade. Oh, yeah. oh, it's like Black Mirror. So like they they go like they get paid for posting and then they buy food with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's literally it, isn't it? Probably. Uh, if they bothered is... to answer the question, that would probably be what they. It, well, so then they'd have alienated posting labor. Right. Oh my god. <laughs> no, we already respect. have that. We already we already uh ex we already uh exploit my surposed value. But, uh, <laughs> surposed value. <laughs> but uh, what is he? He says okay. He says what this. Treatment of environmental catastrophe illustrates as the fantasy structure on which capitalist realism depends. A presupposition that resources are infinite, that the earth itself is merely a husk, which capital can, can at a certain point slough off like a used skin, and that any problem can be solved by the market. In the end, Wally presents a version of this fantasy, the idea that infinite expansion of capital is possible, that capital can proliferate without labor on the off-world ship. Axiom all labor is performed by the robots, that the burning up of the Earth's resources is only a temporary glitch, and that after a suitable period of recovery, capital can terraform the planet and recolonize it. Yet environmental catastrophe features in late capitalist culture only as a kind of simulacrum. Its real implications for capitalism too traumatic to be assimilated into the system. The, the significance of green critiques is that they suggest that far from being the only viable political economic system, Capitalism is, in fact, primed to destroy the entire Earth environment. The relationship between capitalism and eco-disaster is neither co coincidental nor accidental. Capital's need of a constantly expanding market, its growth fetish, means that capital is by its very nature opposed to any notion of sustainability. See, I actually think he's pretty strong when he talks about media in these kinds of ways. That's what the strongest part of the capitalist realism right. book. And then um, the counter to that is you said in an earlier discussion that then the weakest parts was when he tried to, outside of that, talk about real-life institutions or something? He does this thing where I didn't mind the inference he just made here from Wally. I don't mind. I didn't mind it, actually, because it's independently verifiable. But there are times when he talks about, and all cultural theorists do this, and literary theorists do this in a way that I used to really like, because I like the idea that you could just, you know, read a virginia wolf novel and then infer something about the nature of capitalism or something when he jumps to like psychology and he talks about like individual lived experience and he talks about institutional institutions and causation and he infers from his media and cultural analyses these causal facts about that irl that's when i find him to be the weakest it seems to be like the weakness of cultural critique and its relationship between with like psychoanalysis but yeah, I'm, and, I'm and not phenomenology sure that... and phenomenology yeah yeah and, and like post-structuralism arguably too i mean i'm not dismissing that i'm not some reactionary i'm not dismissing those three things out of hand i just like they're like yeah there's a varying degrees at which you can use them successfully and i think this kind of writing and thinking it sells really well because it's really i mean it just 
it makes these complex ideas and esoteric ideas intuitive and, and it makes everybody think about politics and culture and in these cool ways and so whatever that's an advantage of it not a weakness actually it's very good for popularization exactly of, of theory and yeah. for teaching it to be getting the foot in the door and then you can provide you know yeah a, a, like a thing that i said before was like moving from a pamphlet discussion to a textbook discussion yeah where we, you can we can talk on the level of something that i would find you in a pamphlet and then we can get down and dirty with the real theory that would be published in a textbook well, and they're the like textbook, different the things. textbook itself is still a simplification right so you move from the pamphlet to the textbook to the original text to modern papers that's how i would say it <laughs> <laughs> Uh, One of the, like, back to, to Wally, and, like, actually, it's not just Wally. It, it, it's movies like The Lorax, like, any movies that try to talk about the environment, any any movies that have the a, a sort of a, a greedy corporation as, as the bad guy. Uh, a lot of this is an example of what's called interpassivity in, in, the, in the novel. In the novel? What the fuck the, am I talking about? In the goddamn book. Fisher describes this as our way of performing our anti-capitalism for us. Or at least Fisher says that. Is that is that a Zizek thing? Or that's basically Zizek's theory of ideology. Not to be that's glib, but he, yeah. you know he gives the example of the Tibetan prayer wheel, where you spit it and it prays for you, or a sitcom mm -hmm. it, it laughs for you, or you know, and then he relates that to you know like chocolate laxatives and diet free soda, like you know, it's because it's, it's like so it's, then the, the Lorax does your environmentalism for you is then right. the connection. But what, by also admitting that it's all... Uh, For consumption, which is convenient. <laughs> yes, and admitting that it's all futile. It's, we're at the end of history, we can't do anything anyway, so it's like... Right. Uh, I'm really mad that the Lorax doesn't have any uh, structural critique. Uh, really <laughs> disappointed. <laughs> I mean, I, we, I don't like this section, but it's uh, fine or whatever. As, in illustration, I challenged one student about why he always wore headphones in class. He replied that it didn't matter because he wasn't actually playing any music. In yeah. another lesson, he was playing music in a very low volume through the headphones without wearing them. When I asked him to switch it off, he replied that he couldn't even hear it. Why wear the headphones without playing music or play music without wearing the headphones? Because the presence of the phones on the ears of the knowledge that the music is playing, even if he couldn't hear it, was a reassurance that the matrix was still there within reach. Besides, in a classic example of interpassivity, if the music was still playing, even if he couldn't hear it, then the player could still enjoy it on his behalf. The use of headphones is significant here. Pop is experienced not as something which could have impacts upon public space, but as a retreat into a private, edipoid consumer bliss, a walling up against the social. The consequence of being hooked into the entertainment matrix is twitchy, agitated interpassivity, an inability to concentrate or focus. Students' incapacity to connect current lack of focus with future failure, their inability to synthesize time into any coherent narrative is symptomatic of a more than mere demotivation. In fact, it is eerily reminiscent of Jameson's analysis in postmodernism and consumer society. Jameson observed there that the Lacan's theory of schizophrenia offered a suggested aesthetic model for understanding the fragmenting of subjectivity in the face of emerging entertainment industrial complex. With the breakdown of the signifying chain, the Lacanian schizophrenic, Lacanian, I guess, schizophrenic is reduced to an experience of pure material signifiers, or in other words, a series of pure and unrelated presence in time. Jameson was writing in the late 1980s, the period in which most of my students were born. What we in the classroom are now facing is a culturation born into that ahistorical, empty, memnonic blip culture, a culture, a generation that is to say, for whom time has always come ready cut into digital micro slices. See, this is a, this is great because this actually this passage does exactly he does he it's with Fisher it's like it literally combines his strong and his weakness in one <laughs> passage. So he does yeah. so he does like a good decent cultural analysis, and then he makes this inference like and as we talked about before, we, and we'll get to probably later, like social determinants of mental health is like a really well established yeah. thing. I mean, it's just but like the specific mechanism he's proposing here is kind of just like weird. It's kind of it's kind of goofy. Well, yeah, I had a big uh, problem with it because. With pretentious classical music people, one of the big problems with popular music is that it's played in public just mm -hmm. as, like, background noise. And they're like, you're not paying attention to the music. And the classical music people hated that, and they thought that they it was proof that it, it doesn't even count as art anymore. And then, and that's dependent on it just being pop music is like the soup that we swim in in public life. But then Fisher starts talking about how pop music is actually about isolation and i think that that can only really be true if you're talking about an isolation in public 
where well, you like what, exist in public. That is what he's talking about, though, because he talks about that within the Children of Men, right? Is that it's like they exist in this like place where public space doesn't exist. They're just these. And in Wally, you know, if there's public spaces. There's only these different. It's like this weird thing where it's like we withdraw from public space into our technological apparatuses, apparati, apparatuses, whatever, that then connect us to social media and entertainment, which is putatively a form of public as well, but it's a privatized form of public. So we retreat, we're in public, we retreat from public to go back into the public, but a privatized version thereof. And that's the recurring theme of uh, his analysis of uh, Wally, Children of Men, Neuromancer, and I mean, we could probably throw V for Vendetta in there too because of the presence of the screens and stuff and uh, the role of like the that reality game show or whatever it was on it. Oh, um, sure, sure, sure. And the Matrix, obviously, and like whatever. So sometimes I'm aware of becoming a little too boomer, like, oh, uh, what if technology, oh, yeah. but too much? And like Black Mirror, you which, get, you know. Yeah, exactly, Black Mirror. Which, which well, I think like, Black uh, Mirror is like, is, it's like a neo-boomer show. It's for the Zoomers who are yes. spiritual boomers. Yeah. But see, but I'm a spiritually boomer, uh, Zoomer, but I hate the what-if phones, but too much nonsense. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, at the same time, like, it's, I think it is that, he's, he's gesturing at this thing, which is like, how to account for this ever-present role of spectacle, of culture, of the big other, of entertainment. The, the complete... So what are essentially immobilization uh, uh, factors, right? Right. And complete, yeah, and complete fracturing of the public sphere into, into, well, putatively into many privates and the complete wholesale neoliberalization of everything, like, in, in closing the psychic commons, if you will, or like, in closing the neosphere or something to account for its pure dominance and this, what he calls interpassivity and cynicism and, and inability to act and even just organize and relate to each other in, in basic way. I think like, uh, which is a valid point, but it's just, I don't I mean, I actually don't know what my thoughts are because now even talking about it, I'm like, it's becoming more organized in my mind than when I first read it. Oh, one thing on this is Maria George had a had a video on Riverdale about the same topic. Um, she brings up some interesting points about that show. Basically, uh, the the premise of the show is it's this really trashy teen drama, but everyone, but but it's like it's it's sort of the so bad it's good kind of stuff, and everyone who watches it and the the whole fandom all know it's really bad. It's sort of this thing where they they all get to deny their their enjoyment of it for it being teen trashy stuff but they're still enjoying exactly that right i thought that was just an interesting point that she brought up well it's like okay so it's like this something i once said is that like the function of shows like law and order svu or csi i mean in general crime dramas is that they allow you know the well-ordered normative petty bourgeois viewer to indulge in in the fucking like lurid and sexual and violent and gross and whatever because at the end of the episode the moral order of the world is always restored because you get like a punishment of the of the deviance or whatever so so they get to um like they use and and it's like there's this very kind of Foucauldian thing where it's like you you read these court trials from the medieval era and these court trials are just like the most like dirty like licentious like stuff you like intricate details about like sexuality and, and body odors and then mm. and, and just like and absurd like portrayals of you know deviant acts or whatever and if you get the impression that if everybody wants to engage in this and indulge in the deviance but in order to do so they actively condemn and shun it and like that way they get to participate in deviance while at the same time restoring the moral or maintaining the moral order in the first place and i think that's yeah, actually like really uh true i mean actually like there's a reason there are like so many like serial killer documentaries on oh, yeah. uh, on netflix and like oh god pe people who think they're interesting because oh, so complex oh. though yeah no no no, but, no people who think th they themselves are interesting oh people. That, that they're an interesting yeah person. it's just, they're like oh wow I, you know i'm kind of a sociopath myself <laughs> shut the <laughs> fuck <laughs> up <laughs> uh, fucking well, kills yeah. me you know, it's funny Sounds too. Like something like, that Elon Musk would say. <laughs> oh, he would be God. right. <laughs> <laughs> it's you know, you know that uh, that thread you did about uh, BDSM and kink and, and sex work the other day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And so, and you talked about like where like they'll do the concern troll, where they'll make an expression of disgust, but then we'll brush it aside and pretend that that's not their real yeah. motivation or whatever. I think that's the identical phenomenon here, which is this weird obsession with policing sexuality and deviant identity stems from this weird dialectic of wanting to be able to indulge in it while at the same time punishing it and restoring the moral order. And it's interesting because this is an area where, you know, the big people who write on these kinds of topics are people like uh, like Nietzsche, Durkheim, and uh, Foucault and stuff. And I think that's actually, there's a real place in this kind of stuff where, the, especially on questions of deviance and punishment, where those scholars are actually incredibly complementary to a Marxian and a radical analysis of things. And because that's actually, there's a lot of these social dynamics that are autonomous and real and important. Yeah, I don't know. It's just, uh, I mean, there's a long tradition about analyzing ideology and culture, but also deviance and punishment that actually really have a con- strong, because the maintaining of the social order, which is the maintaining of a moral order, is something which consistently, consistently in anthropology and sociology and in psychology and so on, is found to be one of the main driving factors of people's behaviors. I mean, just in general. Mm. And like, and even in, I mean, actually, even in like behavior on evolutionary game theory, it's of importance because it's yeah, I mean, how you'll you see explain. this in little kids policing each other's like gender expression Ex- and shit like that. Exactly. Like, and I like was gonna five go years old, these little Nazis are yeah. out here like screaming <laughs> about like what color pants you have. Like, what the and, fuck? and I was and I was gonna say misogyny, misogyny, because Kate Mann says misogyny is like the police force of sexism and patriarchy. You're mm-hmm. policing the gender identities or whatever in order to ma- maintain this moral order. And this is connected to the fact that like you know a result that's actually not universal, but it's found pretty reliably across different political orientations because obviously conservative means something different in every culture but conservatism is very highly associated with a strong disgust reaction and disgust reactions are strongly oh, yeah. are yeah. strong and disgust reactions are strongly related to notions of purity danger mary douglas would put it uh, of the sacred and the profane of punishment and of the moral order and with that actually can this i think actually is not too far afield because <clears throat> this allows us to go back because the maintaining of the moral the, order. The narrative comedian who just said, you know, Hitler just was cleaning up. Uh, that, that was Owen Benjamin. He was an epic what? guy. That's. See, yeah, like, <laughs> like. But, yeah, he said he hated filth. He was just cleaning up. Yeah. And I mean, fascists and conservatives literally believe that. Right. Yeah. And Jason Stanley talks about how propaganda and fascism, it's, lang- it's the language, always the language of pestilence and filth that's used to demonize. And actually, in a, a book, I read a study of genocide, CD that I was reading, and they talk about this too. Almost all genocides are preceded by a propaganda campaign which associates that enemy with pestilence and filth. And I think the maintenance of the moral order in this abstract sense, society as such, is one of the main obstacles, one of the main ideological, personal, and psychological obstacles to fundamental social change, whether it be capitalism or patriarchy, and linking this back to Fisher and capitalist realism, and neoliberalism, and so on and so forth, is that neoliberalism is the ideological project by which capitalism has been naturalized as the only possible moral and social order. And therefore, even where it's considered distasteful and we want to indulge in its abolition, there's a patent cultural or psychological ideological block to prevent us from doing so. Yeah. And there's also the, the side benefit that in regards to interpassivity w- with media gives the sense that so long as we consume the right things, we're okay. Right. And that's liberalism in general. Yeah. This is tied into the Live 8 fundraiser in which basically I, I think, is, it, is he quoting Zizek or is, it, or is it Fisher himself? I can literally never tell in this book. Um, uh, he, he's he's saying he's saying it is it's himself. I think. Well, I'll find it. I'll find it. Just yeah. Sure, sure. Oh yeah, um, he's it's his own idea. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's basically this idea that it's this analysis of of how these protests end up functioning, or I, you, you can barely call that a protest, but basically it seems like what's in the minds of people uh, attending is that they need to make their voices heard mm-hmm. to the resource having eternal figure that is just too mean to make the world a better place right 
Live Aid was a strange kind of protest, a protest that everybody could agree with. Who actually wants poverty? And it's not that Live Aid was a degraded form of protest. On the contrary, it was in Live Aid that the logic of protest was revealed in its purest form. The protest impulse of the 60s posited a malevolent father, the harbinger of the rea uh, reality principle that supposedly, cruelly, and arbitrarily denies the right to total enjoyment. This father has unlimited access to resources, but he selfishly and senselessly hoards them. Yet it is not capitalism, but protest itself, which depends upon this figuration of the father. And one of the successes of the current global elite has been their avoidance of identification with the figure of the hoarding father, even though the reality they impose on the young is substantially harsher than the conditions they protested against in the 60s. Indeed, it was of the course, the I don't like the sign, but it was, of course, the global elite itself in the form of entertainers such as Richard Curtis and Bono, which organized the Live Aid event. I'm sorry, they're rich and famous, but they're not global elites in a sense that's like meaningful. <laughs> that's a, like, yeah. We could kill them all and it would not have a Can single... Can we talk about how Mark <laughs> Fisher is just a huge boomer talking about how the difference between back in when we had Nirvana and the difference yeah. between that and <laughs> rap music. Oh, well, no. He, he doesn't seem to like Nirvana, though. If he see, Because he said that Nirvana is like the, the, the first, like... Thing he, of this. He he doesn't like Nirv he shows that Nirvana like leads to rap music, if I remember well, the passage correctly. Alternative and independent don't designate something outside mainstream culture. Rather they are styles, in fact the dominant styles within mainstream. I think that's actually a really good point, how cultural protest is always co opted by the yeah. capitalist system. Like, you know, it's like epate le bourgeois, like upsetting bourgeois norms, like surrealism and Dadaism. But those are immediately became commodified. All theater of the absurd, it all just became immediately just like accepted into this particular set. Anyway, no one embodied and struggled with this deadlock more than Kurt Cobain and Nirvana. In his dreadful lassitude and objectless rage, Cobain seemed to give weird voice to the dependency of the generation that had come after history, whose every move was anticipated, tracked, bought, and sold before it even happened. Cobain knew that he was just another piece of the spectacle, that nothing runs better on MTV than a protest against MTV, knew that his every move was a cliche scripted in advance, even that even realizing it is a cliche, the impasse that paralyzed Cobain is precisely the one that James had described. Like postmodern culture in general, Cobain found himself in a world in which stylistic innovation is no longer possible, where all that is left is to imitate dead styles, to speak through the masks, and with the voices of the styles in the imaginary museum. Here, the existential angst of Nirvana belongs to an older moment. What succeeded them was a pastiche rock, which produced the forms of past without anxiety. When he died, rock was, uh, yeah, here it is. When he died, rock was already eclipsed by hip hop, whose global success has presupposed just the kind of pre-corporation by capital, which I have alluded to above. For much hip hop, any naive hope that youth culture could change anything has been replaced by a hard headed embracing of the brutally reductive version of reality. I, this is a, yeah, this is so bad. I was like, in hip hop. He doesn't listen. He doesn't to listen hip -hop. to hip hop. <laughs> <laughs> But he it's also, just, like, also wait, no, the, the idea the that, yes. like, stylistic innovation is impossible is weird for the the 90s. I don't know. Maybe he's just talking, like, within rock music, but I don't know. Music well, especially land. because rap itself is a stylistic innovation, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's possible except the new stuff that's bad. Right. First, it means authentic. This is what he says. He's quoting Simon Reynolds from 1996 essay on The Wire magazine. First, it means authentic, uncompromised music that refuses to sell out to the music industry and stop this. Wait, oh no, wait, oh no, never mind. Wait, wait. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm, it's just so he's very confusing about the referent here. Okay, real has two meanings. First, it means authentic, uncompromised music that refuses to sell out to the music industry. It also signifies that the music reflects a reality constituted by late capitalist economic instability, institutionalized racism, and increased surveillance and harassment of use by the police. Real means the death of the social. It means corporations who respond to increased profits, not by raising pay or improving benefits, but by downsizing. In the end, it was precisely hip-hop's performance of this first version of the real, the uncompromised thing, that enabled its easy absorption into the second reality of late capitalist economic instability, where such authenticity has proved and highly marketable. Gangster rap merely reflects pre-existing social conditions, as many of its advocates claim, nor does it simply cause those conditions, as its critics argue. It doesn't cause that. <laughs> Rather, the circuit whereby hip-hop and late capitalist social field feed into each other is the ones 
by which capitalist realism transforms itself into a kind of anti-mythical myth. The affinity between hip-hop and gangster movies such as Scarface, the Godfather films, Reservoir Dogs, Goodfellas, and Pulp Fiction arises from their common claim to have stripped the world of sentimental illusions to be seen for what it really is, a Hobbesian war of all against all, a system of perpetual exploitation and generalized criminality. See, this is a shitty analysis of hip-hop, but it's an, uh, it's an actually okay inference about protest culture in general. Yeah, uh, right. says, the same neo-noir worldview can be found in the comic books of Frank Miller and in the novels of James Elroy. There's a kind of machismo of de- demythologization in their works. It poses unflinching observers, uh, da, da, da. In his Pitch Blackness, Mike Davis wrote of Elroy 92, there is no light left to cast shadows and evix, easy, evil becomes a forensic banality. The result feels very much like an actual texture, actual moral texture of the Reagan-Bush era, a supersaturation of corruption that fails any longer outrage or even interest. Yet this very desensitization serves a function for capitalist realism. Davis hypothesized that the role of L.A. Noir may have been to a to endorse the emergence of a home, homo reganus. Uh, yes, it's funny. I mean, I have a lot to say about noir and neo noir and Elroy in particular, but it's for, and Mike Davis, but there's a, that's for another day, I think. <laughs> no uh, homo reganus. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's so like, you know, and I, you know, this is like something I used to joke because I say authenticity is just something that was invented to sell greeting cards, basically. I mean, I actually agree <laughs> with that. And, and free will is a similar ideology. It's like it's meant to justify punishment, among other things. I mean, that's more, more controversial, but the, I think the fact that authenticity and free will and anti-commodification as a cultural thing are so easily commodified and turned into these sentimental ideologies. And, and there's two books I wish we had read along with this because they're so relevant. One is, I've talked about it with you all before, it's the Harcourt book, Illusions of Free Markets. Yeah. So he traces the idea of the birth of the idea of the natural order of the market was always a punitive and disciplinary idea that was tied to strong views about, again, the moral order, punishment, retribution, and deviance. Mm. And he talks about how, in practice, the spread of capitalism and especially you see all those same lines in, like, Fox News, like, all the time. Like, why do poor but, people have refrigerators? The modern category of liberty emerged in reaction to an earlier integrated version of punishment and political public economy known in the 18th century as police. So he uh, shows how the spread of capitalism has, and especially neoliberalism, has always been spread by the, has been accompanied or preceded by the spread of carceralism and the prison system. And the other person who makes the same argument and actually says so much stuff that's Conversion with Fisher in very cool ways is my favorite Bay historian of economic thought, Murawski. And he wrote this book called Never Let a Serious Crisis Go to Waste. And it's about how in the 2007, the neoliberal dominant ideology was shown to be absolute, not on its own terms, to be absolute horseshit, right? It was not able to technocratically and expertisely predict or maintain anything. It failed completely, whatever. But it's not only did it persist, got stronger and so he says yeah. he actually tries to account how that happened i mean when everybody even in the he was talking about even in the mainstream papers you had people talking about marx and you had you had a, you had alan greenspan admitting he was wrong and paul volker admitting he was wrong and larry summers admitting he was wrong you had, you had all of these things and his book is uh, he's actually written five books on this subject it's like one of his unifying things he's, he has one called science mart about commodifying science and he has a what about uh, the the road from Mount Pelerin about the birth of neoliberalism, and his history is why does the serious crisis never go to waste? It's a very amazing book. He starts with the freaking Mount Pelerin, Pelerin. I always get it uh, with like you know Hayek, Mises, uh, Buchanan, Friedman, Popper, briefly Polanyi, uh, and all these ordo liberals and these other people and how they came together. And they literally said, let's do the vanguardist model of the Marxians works. This is what you should do. So we're going to create a capitalist vanguard and we're going to slowly but surely we're going to get the sucker of these big corp- corporations and capitalists. And we're going to win on several domains by taking over the broader culture, the academic culture, the public opinion, also literally policy and politics. It literally fucking worked. And like they really quickly got funding. And all of a sudden you had these foundations, these dark wing 
money, you know, that fund universities and schools and grants. And you had the creation out of nowhere of these Austrian economics departments like at George Mason. You had the rise of these like the Liberty Fund and that Smith Institute and the Mises and the Cato and the da 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 da. And you had all of this stuff. You had the spread of you know Ayn Rand and Hayek and whatever. And you had them writing letters to each other, literally saying like. We have to be obfuscatory because we have to keep people basically stupid and have to have like a stupid version of our ideas. And they were they were wrote in this uh, in this almost like contemptuous contemptuous way of the populace and all this stuff. And actually, he also documents you know internal resistance to this. Popper quit, Polanyi quit, uh, da da da. And he documents you know they're re- first with Reagan and Thatcher and you know Deng Xiaoping and this links him to this links it to like the David Harvey account of neoliberalism and possibly the Jameson and their entrenchment their takeover of economics their 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 vast proliferation of neoclassical economics in other guises so through evolutionary psychology and sociobiology and in different evolutionary accounts, through market behavior and market design, through rational actor theory, through the economics of crime, through whatever, they slowly, you know, this disciplinary imperialism, they invaded every other social science and humanities and got immense traction among it. These and they believe their own bullshit too, which is like- Some of them like, do. Some of well, them do. kind of, but it's like, so you, you brought up the point about them having this well, spiteful okay, shit so Giannis towards like... Varoufakis has a story about, I, I forget which architect of neoclassical economics he attended a lecture at. And after the lecture, the economist that he was, that he, uh, the lecturer said something along the lines, uh, in response to a question, he said something along the lines of, you're confusing what is interesting with what can be applied to reality talking about, you know, the dominant form of economic theory. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's like at the top, they don't actually believe it. It's just everyone under They they, they don't. don't. Not anymore. I think like there's a certain way they still justify it to themselves. And and what I was trying to get at is like, so there's this spiteful view of the people that they're trying to sell this bullshit to. On some level, like all of them are just like, if they just fucking consumed the right way if they just acted the right way if they, these stupid little people these stupid little consumers just acted the right way things would be fine yes right? and that's why they tie it to the project of the prison system we're asking talks about this yeah because the idea is that if you f- fall within the bounds of rationality consume and act the right way in the capitalist order you should but then you need to have this fucking incredibly strong state power force that's literally just going to crush anybody who deviates from it even slightly that's why he says they, the neoliberals totally abandoned their opposition to the state. They were no longer done with it. It's their opportunistic about it. They they would openly criticize it, but they would actively advocate regulation and, and government intrusion in some aspects in the prison system and punishment. And see, isn't that actually the solid time together very nicely because – and Murawski has a second book that came out recently, The Knowledge We Have Lost in Information. And he actually talks about the fact that they don't believe their own stuff. And I've, been, you know, it's funny. Like I study the sociology of economic knowledge. I go to these economics conferences. I whatever, and it's very clear that they don't. They, the, you know, the talks will be. They'll give talks where they excoriate the theory of like, you know, supply and demand or whatever, market efficiency. That, you know, it'll be like a, a memorial lecture by this or whatever. And then, and Danny Roderick, all people, is political economist from Harvard or now Princeton, I think. He wrote in his most recent book on trade and stuff. He talks about how he talked to other economists. He says, you all full well know that free trade theory is not really true, that the distributional effects are totally undercut any things gains, and the theory of comparative advantage is not really sustained, especially with mobile factors, institutional issues, and so on. And the economists all say, of course we know that. And they say, then why is he, then why do you do that? And he says, well, because the, the common people's preference towards uh, government interact intrusion into trade and stuff <laughs> is so strong that if we gave it any legitimation, they'd go too far in the other direction. So if we want to maintain it, we have to tell the public one thing and they'll meet us in the middle. I mean, it's totally, that's a total self-delusional view. But And Murawski talks about in knowledge we lost the information, like they don't really believe their own stuff. And then uh, uh, it's actually very interesting the way this all links together, actually. I think it's cool because the Verifakis book, The Great Minotaur, it's an awesome history of the contemporary economics of the neoliberal order. So is the book yeah. Secrets of the Temple, 
by the Federal Reserve. And then Murawski gives the fucking awesome intellectual and social and organizational history. And what is it? David Harvey gives like just like the standard political economy history. And all of this together, you know, ties in, I think, with this Zizekian and this Fisherian and this Jamesian points actually all very quite nicely. They tie together in a very interesting, cool way. Oh, and Graeber's Utopia of Rules, I think, and Bullshit Jobs. I think these are all function as nice little constellation, which allows us to link all of these different ideas, the capitalism, the ideology, the moral order, the culture, the indifference, the naturalization of neoliberalism, the public assertions of the demise of the state while it's incredible uh, ramping up and bureaucratization and so on, the ideas of the end of history. I mean, it's just like they all, they all link together in this very interesting and profoundly consistent and coherent way. And this brings me back, though, to the beginning. Remember, I was saying, like, I, I think people have a harder time imagining some other things in the end of capitalism, but if we want to all tie it together, Nitzan and Bichler basically say we, we shouldn't even divide the state and capital conceptually. Capitalization is just what the state does. I don't know if I agree with that, but if that's a, that framework actually is pretty useful because then it allows us to just be like, there is no abolishing capitalism by abolishing the state. But anyway, I think all of this links together to like why it is so hard for people to end, imagine the end of capitalism and all this other stuff because of the sacredness of this moral order, the success of its cultural ideological project, which also has been an incredibly profoundly powerful disciplinary institutional policy project. So it affected, you know, they, 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 they did a dual assault against, you know, the superstructure and the base at the same time. You know what I mean? They weren't taking any chances. <laughs> they, they, weren't, they weren't taking chances with regard to theories of history. So they, they, they just went for both at the same time, you know, it's just <laughs> the neoliberals and how profoundly successful they were. I mean, their way of thinking notions like authenticity and stuff Managed but, to I mean, make... it's ultimately like abundantly clear when you talk to like you know, like Austrians and stuff like that. It's all founded on insecurity. They absolutely need to show that capitalism is the only thing. It's the yes. only realistic thing yes. that we can possibly talk about. And then I think if Fisher takes it from there and goes to talk about, well, then in that case, we should show how it is absolutely not realistic. We need, to, yeah. we need to meet them on their own terms and prove it. And he goes into three examples of, of why it's not sustainable. The right. first being environmental. And, and, you know, this is literally Moraski's career now. This is, like, literally what he... He's, you know, started off as just a historian of economic thought and of math and, and all these other things. I mean, one of, literally probably the most perspicacious historian of thought I've ever read, actually. But now he's entirely... He talks about... because. Because it's just like, it's his personal thing. He wants it to see it fucking die. So he's just like, he, you know, he doesn't necessarily have hopes for it. So he ties like this paper recently called, uh, I'll send it to you. It's a great, uh, it's a YouTube video too. Hell is truth. Seem, seem too late. And he talks about the enclosure of the academic and scientific commons as being one of these, like, despite uh, it being the place where neoliberalism was birthed in this new kind of way, uh, at least ideologically, it's their last place of enclosure. And everybody's welcoming in the neoliberalization and enclosure of the scientific commons under the exact opposite premise. Anyway, yeah, that's his thing. And he, his whole point is that, it's, look, it's been laid bare that this is all oh, nonsense, both empirically and in people's experience. But not only that, in the works of these people themselves, I mean, at least in the <laughs> academic stuff, the popularization of it never existed. And he talks about the central contradiction. It's like, if markets are super efficient, then why do economists need to exist, right? So, uh, <laughs> so right, right? If they're perfect on their own, why do they need to exist? So he talks about the rise of these things like market behavior and market design. So now it becomes, once you get a smart economist to come in and institutionally design through the right norms, metrics, and information, the correct market and have implemented through state policy, then the market will take over and be super efficient or whatever. So now they get to have it both ways. They get to be, they, <laughs> they get to keep eating and, and they get the free market, whatever. That tacitly admits that, that markets and stuff have to be designed and made and enforced. They're not pre-existing things. People don't realize how successful the project of hegemony is i mean i i guess it'd be weird it's weird to call it the project of it because it's just always there at least this specific version of it you don't have to believe in an idealistic liberal affirmational view of the world to understand that having our cultural social uh, entertainment psychological and moral world completely colonized and enclosed and taken over in technological world taken over by these ideologies and these architects of them, it's not going to be fucking good for either ourselves or for revolution or anything. 
Fisher himself, though, falls into the Bergeois idealist trap, I think, some of the times, when it goes too far the other direction and it only focuses on these cultural and moral things. You know? So yeah, I, w- one thing I have issue with is it fits really well, right? The, the idea that, oh, you know, we can just meet them on their own terms and show capitalism to not be realistic. And that's like, it's so effective in one-on-one conversation. I have such an easy time doing this myself, talking about how the contradictions of capital are going to lead to its demise. As soon as I can get the conversation towards that direction, everything just falls naturally. And it's really easy. Even um, with conservatives, really you can convinced. do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. With anyone. My, it, my, my favorite people to talk to, the, the people I consider the easiest to talk to are libertarians not the fashy kind the five of them that are like yeah i know exactly what you mean i know exactly you know you know i know know exactly what you mean yeah yeah, yeah. (laughs) yeah. these are the easiest conversations in the world and even the ones that okay have you noticed this phenomenon of the libertarian person who identifies as a libertarian but says i wish bernie had won oh yeah of course what what are you talking about like you know it's like uh, even like penn gillette said something like that what they're expressing a lot of the time is this idea that they don't like that they're not being represented, right? And yeah, then in any way, from yeah. there, it's very easy to say, oh, well, why aren't you represented, right? The, these conversations end up being really easy on an individual level. Yeah, um, but they have no scale or scalability. Yeah. And, that, and that's my concern with a lot of his prescriptions. They fit really nicely. They work really well with the thesis of the book but I'm not sure how they scale. That's the problem with, you know, liberalism in general and the way way it's sort of taken over even the left. When you see discussions of advocates of nonviolence and of pacifism, you know, they often talk as if we could just go around and convince every Nazi not to be a Nazi, you know, (laughs) like through personal discussion. I mean, surely if you devoted enough time and energy to convincing one of them, you'll do it, but you know, at great risk and cost to yourself and over a very long fucking period of time. And as long as the Nazi org still exists, they're going to pump them out faster than you can convert them back. The one thing is, uh, just just to kind of half counter this, there is the idea of sincerity used in a certain way that can actually be subversive. I think if you've ever seen Non-Compete, he goes into this really well. You'll, you'll meet some people who... Their sincerity, your, your immediate reaction is like, what, you're wasting your time, like, what are you doing? But like, it gets, in, in certain ways, it can be like surprisingly effective and, and catch people off guard. So I, I think there's something there, but I'm not sure how to utilize it. Scale, well, I mean, right? Foucault would talk this like Perezia, like it's speaking your truth, speaking plainly, speaking your truth, not necessarily to power, because truth and power are kind of constitutive. But like the problem with that, I think, is that the concept of sincerity is quite like the concept of authenticity and that it's a commodified – it becomes a sentimental commodity used to do exactly the opposite. You know what I mean? So, sure, uh, yeah, at scale for sure. For me, the ideal model is to be like serious and take things seriously but not be self-serious and so not take yourself very seriously. You know, sure. No one succeeds at that, but that's the most convincing person, I mean, in my opinion. The closest people who do achieve that, I mean, you know, we don't have to like them, but they're good at what they do, I think, are people like these popularizers. I mean, I have a lot of problems with them, so whatever. It's like, but like Zizek or, or Chomsky or whatever, they're, they're the master of combining their own self-deprecation and just total self-abandonment with this committed belief in what they're actually talking about. The neoliberals, they only have one response. It's always a hypocritical version. Oh, you're a leftist, yet you own an iPhone, or oh, da 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 right? Yeah. That's like their only response, right? So when these people come along who, and they don't get riled up, like when you attack them or mock them personally or whatever, they are very successful at at least getting people into these ideas. I don't know. They're not scalable and they're not right. All that, I mean, yep. right. But like whatever, there's actually a, a, me- a method to their madness or whatever. But then the For opposite sure. spectrum, you have the very self-serious people who are not serious whatsoever. It's so funny because it's always the thing and it's opposite. So this is both the trad left – DSA, Smashing on Steel, Matt Bruning types, and their main target of criticism, the woke gold liberal rad lib stereotype. This is both the weird internet ML with... Who supposes themselves to be the next Che. Exactly. Or the (laughs) potential planning theorist. Much love to y'all too, but like, you know, I think the opposite, the good other of the 
self-series ML who fancies themselves an eccentric planner is the self-series uh, uh, left com who considers fancies themselves the next Marx, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> what you tell these people is these four groups, right? Is that, and we all do this, right? So I'm not, I'm not exempting myself from the problem of yeah. self-seriousness, right? It's like, that would be absurd, but we all have uh, fragile egos and imposter complex issues. It's irrelevant. These types of people, they violently enforce it, right? So if you challenge their self-appointed status or label as expert or something on something, then that's like the worst sin in their book. And they immediately pounce with great speed and whatever. And it's really made bad by the existence of social media worsens that in so many ways. So easy. And that is the least effective form of, uh, of recruitment that, that could ever exist. And actually brings us to another Mark Fisher essay, which I'll, I'm going to bring up, which y'all have read, the Vampire Castle one. Oh, sure. I don't think I've gotten around to that one, have oh, you? Oh, I've had it. So exiting the Vampire Castle, I think it's funny because his two enemies in the thing are, he says, anarchists and something else. It's like funny because I actually agree with his analysis, but I would totally reverse his who he who he blames for it. But the idea is, here we go. He says, the law of the vampire castle. One, the first law of the vampire castle is individualize and privatize everything. While in theory, it claims to be in favor of structural critique, in practice, it never focuses on anything except individual behavior. Some of these working class types are not terribly well brought up and can be very rude. Remember, condemning individuals is always more important than paying attention to impersonal structure. The acting actual ruling class propagates ideologies of individualism while tending to act as a class. The vampire castle, the deep citizens of the ruling class, does the opposite. It pays lip service to solidarity and collectivity while always acting as if the individual's categories imposed by power really hold. Because they are petite bourgeois at the core, the members of the vampire castle are intensely competitive. But this is repressed in the passive-aggressive manner typical of the bourgeoisie. What holds them together is not solidarity but mutual fear, the fear that they will be the next one to be out and exposed and condemned. The second law of the Fairfire Castle is make thought and action appear very, very difficult. There must be no lightness and certainly no humor. Humor isn't serious by definition, right? Thought is hard work for people with polished voices and furrowed brows. Where there's confidence, introduce skepticism. Say, don't be hasty. We have to think more deeply about this. Remember, having convictions is oppressive and might lead to gulags. The third law of Vampire <laughs> Castle is propagate as much guilt as you can. The more guilt, the better. People must feel bad. It's a sign that they understand the gravity of things. It's okay to be class privileged if you feel guilty about privilege and make others in a subordinate class position to you feel guilty too. You do some good works for the poor too, right? Fourth law of the Vampire Castle is essentialize. While fluidity of identity, plurality, and multiplicity are always claimed on behalf of the VC members, partly to cover up their own affirming wealthy, privileged, or bourgeois simulationist backgrounds, the enemy is always too essentialized. Since the desires animating the VC are in large part the priest desires to excommunicate and condemn, this is the moral order thing I was talking about, there has to be a strong distinction between good and evil, with the latter essentialized. Notice the tactic. Uh, da, 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 da. Their whole identity, because I actually don't agree, I think this is a stupid thing because it's a very boomer comment he says next. Like, Notice the tactic, X has made a remark, was behaved in a particular way. These remarks and behavior might be considered as transphobic and sexist. So far, okay, but the next move, which is the kicker, X then becomes defined as transphobic, sexist. I, I mean, I guess like, I get what he's going for there, but it's just totally it's silly agree. comments. Yeah. But oh, okay. I, well, yeah, that that I I see that like all the time. So, um, oh god, I, I oh, hadn't oh even... sorry, May I just I just want to yeah, yeah, go for it, go uh, for it. Once the VC has mustered its wish hunt, the victim, often from a working class man, can be reliably goaded into losing their temper, further securing their position as pariah leaders to be consumed in caffeine frenzy. Again, I actually like I agree with what he's saying, but he's a really shitty example. I don't think. Yeah, you know, the fifth law of the vampire castle is think like a liberal because you are one. The VCs work up of constantly stoking up reactive outrage consists of endlessly pointing out the screamingly obvious. Capital behaves like capital. It's not very nice. Repressive state apparatuses are repressive. We must protest. All right, there we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll have these criticisms of his prescriptions, but I think we should probably talk about those prescriptions as well, right? So there's one, the trying to point out the contradiction in capital and the environment, which he doesn't go into too much depth in. Turn to whisper in your ear